Good evening, and welcome to the last of our lectures in the 2014 series, Global Diseases, Voices from the Vanguard. By now, most of you know that this is a joint operation between Professor Pat Thomas and the Center for Tropical and Emerging Global Diseases. Pat is the Knight Chair in Health and Medical Journalism in the Grady College of Journalism and Mass Communication. And I'm Dan Colley from the Center for Tropical and Emerging Global Diseases. So thank you for being here on this late afternoon. The rain threatened and now has gone away. Uh, the intent of these lectures, as I think most of you know, is to try and reach across North and South Campus in terms of things that deal with global research, global health, and what might be done about it. So tonight, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce today's Voices lecture, Dr. Nancy Saravia. I've known Nancy for a good many years, and if I told you how many, then you would think that I probably met her when she was three or four. Um, but that's not true. I met her when she was an astute and eager PhD student at Vanderbilt University. And since that time, Nancy has lived up to and exceeded my visions uh, for her future, and my visions were pretty high. Uh, I set the bar very high on Nancy, and she's managed to surpass that considerably. The first thing to note is that after obtaining her PhD, Nancy returned to Cali, Colombia as a postdoctoral associate, and she never looked back. She's created her niche in Cali, and she continues to expand upon it and refine that niche. In doing so, Nancy has made major regional and international contributions to biomedical science due to her triple threat capability. We don't have any triple threats anymore, but her excellence in research, training, and administration has carried her through. She's consistently published innovative, significant research, both on basic science and on field and clinical sciences. Uh, and that has actually translated into some changes in how we deal with some of the things that Nancy studies. So she's also gone on to provide these gu this guidance and what to do about the disease that she studies, which is really something in this day of sort of specialized, focalized research. So in addition to her research, uh, and often through her research, she's trained many, many students in Cali, Columbia. Now, uh, I think that she's in, endued them with her fervor for science, and I suspect that she's probably just as proud of all her students and their accomplishments as she is of her own research. But perhaps the most awe-inspiring part of Nancy's career has been her establishment and the continued development of an institution called CDAIM, the Centro Internacional de Investigaciones Médicas. And this is in Cali. This standalone biomedical research institute is essentially Nancy's creation, and she's kept it going for so many years, and that's a really incredible accomplishment. Its importance to Colombian and regional scientific research and training can be gauged by the accolades such as Nancy's receipt of Colombian citizenship by adoption instigated by the Ministry of Foreign Relations in Colombia, which came with this quote, in recognition of work benefiting the people of Colombia. Nancy has been widely recognized by outstanding awards, I won't go through them all, from the likes of the American Society for Tropical Medicine and Hygiene and the American Society for Microbiology, as well as the Republic of Colombia. And it's my privilege and pleasure to present to you as this evening's Voices from the Vanguard lecture, Dr. Nancy Saravia, an admitted leash maniac. You don't see many of those on the street. So generous. So thank you all for being here, for listening to this story that I hope to share with you today. 
I should be able to say that I'm a recovering Leish maniac, but I'm, I'm not. So mm -hmm. it goes on. The story doesn't start exactly here, but it's a good place to start. And that is by recognizing some of the people who have influenced my career and my purpose in research and in life. So the first one here, Lloyd Rosaboom, was a medical entomologist at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. And he was the, my mentor of my master's degree when I first went to Cali. Um, I went to the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health to do a master's degree because I wanted to go and study medicine afterwards. But one of the great lessons I've learned is that you make plans and then stuff happens. So I went there and I met a Colombian guy, fell in love, went to do my thesis in Cali by way of Tulane, and got married and had a little girl. And so no medical school, which was a good thing after all. I'm so bad about making quick decisions. <laughs> and so this was one of the people that has influenced me and he's no longer with us, he's been gone a while. But he made a lot of discoveries in Latin America about different types of uh, vectors of malaria and other uh, vector-borne diseases, but principally malaria. So when I went back to Cali, I found that there were just too many things that I didn't know and I needed to find out more. And so at 19, uh, uh, three years later, I went back to do my doctoral degree and um, my husband had a Rockefeller Foundation fellowship and they said Vanderbilt's the place to go because there he can study economics and you can study immunoparasitology with Dan Colley. So there I went and there he is. And a year and a half after that, my husband decided that he wasn't so happy there he, and he wanted to go elsewhere and he went to the University of Wisconsin. And so he transferred there, but my scholarship at Vanderbilt wasn't transferable to Wisconsin. But my generous mentors, Dan, and also Sidney Kolowick, who I couldn't find a picture of, said, you can go there and do your thesis and it's not a problem. You'll maintain your scholarship and we'll support you. And that's what happened. And so at the University of Wisconsin, I worked in the Immunobiology Research Center with Fritz Bach and in the genetics laboratory with Robert DeMars. And as it turned out, I ended up not doing immunoparasitology at all. I ended up doing immunobiology, basic immunobiology, transplantation, transplantation immunobiology, and um, somatic cell genetics. So you make plans and then stuff happens. And it turned out that one of my teachers in biochemistry at Vanderbilt was Stan Cohen. And he was a very, um, he just it was very simple in his explanations, a brilliant person, absolutely, won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of epidermal growth factor. And at the University of Wisconsin, I learned to do starch gel electrophoresis from Oliver Smithies. He invented that, and I used it later for typing of trypanosomes and leishmania, back when that was the way to figure out what species they were. And he won the Nobel Prize too not for starch gel electrophoresis, but for uh, uh, genetically transformed mice. So all of these people, I mean, I went to do one thing and I ended up with a whole repertoire of disciplinary exposures and, and experiences. And it was the best preparation for going back and trying to figure out how to keep things going in Colombia for the past almost 40 years. And so if I had done it the way I had planned, it wouldn't have worked at all. And so 
another person who influenced me, and I don't know, you're all so young in here, maybe you don't know this guy, but that's Theodore Seuss Geisel, Dr. Seuss. And uh, he has some marvelous uh, things to share with kids and older kids. So when I got back to Colombia, I came to this uh, program called the ICMRT of Tulane University, the International Center for Medical Research and Training. And CDM is the same thing in Spanish. And so that was a, a bilateral technical assistance mission with the Universidad del Valle in Cali. And it lasted from 1961 to 75. I went there for the first time in 1971. And then I went back to, 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 to study in 74. And when I came back in 78, the program had moved out of the university because of a, uh, basically the university uh, decided not to renew the contract. There was a lot of political unrest. And so it had moved out to a, to a, to a different site in downtown and was taken up as partner with Colciencias, which is the National Science Foundation in Colombia. So it went from being bilateral to multilateral. And I came in at that point as a postdoc. And uh, a, few a few years later, I became the, the general coordinator. I was explaining to uh, uh, Kojo today that the director left and, and in 74, I mean, in 84, and I became the general coordinator, and I had all the responsibilities of the director, and he was also chief of the mission, but I was the general coordinator instead of those other things, which, which was fine. It was, it was great, because then I didn't have to take, you know, all the responsibility, even though I had it. So um, this, this program developed over the years, and in order to s support the, 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 um, the program, Colciencias eventually provided some grant support, but in 1990, Tulane pulled out of the program. They applied for an, uh, an, uh, uh, an, an, uh, the renewal, and it wasn't funded, and so they decided that they could no longer afford an act for all. It had been almost, you know, over 30 years that they'd been working there, and so Colciencias said, what do we do? Let's, should we close it? Should we move it to Bogota? What to do? So they said, let's make this an autonomous nonprofit organization. And an autonomous research center in a place like Colombia in 1990, there's only one funding source, you know, and it's Colciencias. And so we have had this challenge since then of permanently funding the institution based on uh, grants and contracts. So it's been, it's been an interesting experience, and um, you can do it. but. You have, to, you have to be creative. So when I came back in 78, I thought, I'm going to be here two years, and then i got to go back to the States and you know, get back to the mainstream. But I discovered all the potential and all the, the, the desire of the people around me in the organization, a lot of young people eager to learn. And I just felt committed. And so I took it up, I, I, I just, you know, decided to pursue this. And so, in a way, CDM became my adopted egg. Those of you who know the story of Horton Hatches the Egg um, can maybe understand what that means. It was really a, a, a decision of commitment and, um, I, have, I think I, I made the right decision. And this is just one page from the book, which I'll read to you. Up out of the jungle, up into the sky, up over the mountains, 10,000 feet high, then down, down the mountain and down to the sea, went the cart with the elephant, egg, nest, and tree. And that's really what it's been like over these almost 40 years now. It's a, it's, it's a, and life is like that. I'm not, I, I think it's, a, uh, it hasn't been like, a, a, like a, a hardship. It's really been a great adventure. 
So what about leishmaniasis? When Tulane left, we were very few. And we decided that in order to move ahead, we should focus on one problem, but from a multidisciplinary perspective. And so leishmaniasis was, was clearly, invisibly, a problem. And Dan was telling me that schistosom people with schistosomiasis, a lot of them, they, you don't know they have the disease. That's a problem, you know, I mean, for, for many different reasons. And so when you have something like this, it's not as difficult to identify as a, as a problem. So just to go through the life cycle a bit, it's transmitted by a phlebotomy and sand fly. The females are, uh, feed before they lay the eggs, and it turns out that as they feed, they take up a mastigotes here in a macrophage that can be in a mammalian host, either human or others, four-legged ones. And they take up this, this parasite, it develops, and then is retransmitted to other mammalian hosts. And it's interesting that factors in the saliva of the sand fly contribute to the success of the infection. So the leishmania is so well adapted to not only the mammalian host, but also the vector, and has been able to utilize some of the vector characteristics to increase its own likelihood of success. Leishmaniasis is a global concern, a global disease. You can see in green here the distribution worldwide. Um, and with this distribution, 70 to 80 percent of the cases are unreported. It's, it's not a, uh, even though it's a reportable disease, a lot of the cases are undetected. And there are approximately 1 to 1.6 million cases per year. And about a third of these occur in the Americas. And within the Americas, the, the countries that have the highest incidents are Colombia and Brazil, and then Peru. So I'm in the right place to work on this. As I mentioned, the need to adapt to the change in our organization moved us to work in a multidisciplinary way on this problem. And that was really crucial for us because we had like the whole group of people, some had worked previously on filariasis, and on, on uh, trypanosomiasis, focused their, their, their experience and their skills on this one problem. And so we recognized um, uh, opportunities and needs for research that were not being recognized by other investigators in the field. This was Tumaco back when I first started there. And uh, this is a, called the Moro, it's in the Pacific Ocean. Here I am on a motorcycle. And uh, this is, uh, Tumaco has a lot of inhabitants whose ancestors came from West Africa. And this sort of style of, of homes is, is evidently similar to what's, what is, is seen in West Africa. And these are some of the young doctors, these three guys, uh, and our um, field assistant who's still there. He's been working with us for 35 years. And these three guys are all doing great things in different institutions. This fellow's at the, the University of Texas. And this one is at Arthur Anderson. And this doctor is at the University of Antioquia. And uh, I think that their experience in Tumaco probably influenced their lives. And, and they remain in, in communication. So, all diseases have a spectrum. And this one gives you some idea of the spectrum that you see with uh, dermal leishmaniasis, from asymptomatic to mild, moderate, severe, and fatal. It's rarely fatal, but there are complications, respiratory complications of very severe um, mucocutaneous leishmaniasis. 
when we first started to work on leishmaniasis, we saw a larger proportion of moderate to severe cases because many of the people who had milder forms did not seek medical attention or they got treated by traditional medicine or a diagnosis wasn't established and so there was a bias towards the more severe, uh, more severe forms of the disease and so the impression was that it was uh, um, uh, I guess a more consequential uh, uh, infection than, than when you see the, the entire spectrum. And so we did a, a, a prospective po population-based study of incidence and prevalence, and we're very surprised to find out that 90% of infections were asymptomatic. But you won't find that until you do a prospective study, because otherwise you're just seeing the, 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 the cases. And only 10% of infections led to symptomatic disease. But a very interesting, uh, thing that we also found and was rather controversial was that there was a uh, high incidence of recurrent disease. It was thought that once you get leishmaniasis and you, and you recover, that you're immune and you don't get it again. And a study subsequently done in Peru where uh, leishmania peruviana is prevalent had only 17% asymptomatic, 83% symptomatic, but they still had this 30% percent recurrence. And so in pointing this out, the spectrum varies according to the organism, the, the population being transmitted, the population being affected. And in uh, Tumaco, it's mainly of Af African descent. And in Peru, in this site, it's mainly indigenous. And so all of those factors contribute to the spectrum. And as I mentioned, the prevalence of, of disease, uh, here I have the time of evolution. And you can see in the earlier period, the frequency of, of, of disease of a long duration was much higher between 1980 and 90 than subsequently because the accumulated prevalence was dealt with and then you started to get uh, 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 early diagnosis and, and didn't have so many severe presentations. So the uh, uh, overall situation was that symptomatic cases are just the tip of the iceberg, but you have a, a large asymptomatically uh, infected population and healed cases who I'll show you remain infected and can probably contribute to transmission. So. When you work in the field, you see different things than when you're in a clinic. Because again, you see the spectrum and you, and you, and you detect cases that wouldn't normally be detect, detect, detected. And so in this case, this little girl, I don't know if you can see, but she has scars here and she has an active lesion here. And so she, over a period of years, had had repeating episodes of, of, of lesions developing. And you can see the consequence for this for a young child and uh, so she'll be scarred for life. But anyhow, the presence of scars was something that was also notable for us because we found that in the endemic area, 60% of the cases with active lesions had scars of a prior episode of disease. And so this was telling us that this is a, a, a disease that is coming, going, and coming again. And that has, has importance in terms of, of control and also in trying to identify the populations that have this, this propensity. When you look at the patients who come to the clinic, it was 17%. So only by going to the field did we see the, the, the proportion of cases that, that had been recurrent. And overall, during a prospective study, we found that over a five-year period, the recurrence was approximately approaching 25%. When I mentioned this at a WHO meeting, the people, some of my colleagues, other Leishmaniacs, they said, oh, that's just, that's not possible. 
you must not be treating them properly. We've never seen that. But it turns out that once people looked, they found it. So we were able to identify the uh, most susceptible population, those who had chronic lesions with the time of evolution over a year. And this was 26% of, uh, of the population. And then those with active disease plus a scar of that population, 23%. And then with a confirmed parasitologically diagnosed relapse, 21%. So this was a situation that had, had previously been un unsuspected. So at the time, and still today, I would say that, that Leishmaniasis research is very oriented towards the murine model. And so it's like Leishmaniasis is seen through mouse-shaped glasses, and it, in a way it biases the sort of research that gets done. And the reason that is, is often stated is that how do you do these studies in human populations? Because in mice you can uh, knock out genes, you can add genes, you can y use uh, genetically uh, identical populations, and the human population is anything but that. And so trying to do these types of studies in human populations was and remains a challenge, but we thought that some of these populations that we had been able to identify in the longitudinal population-based studies, those with chronic disease, with recurrent disease, treatment failures, another group, and the asymptomatically infected residents of the endemic foci offered opportunities to understand uh, the natural history and the reasons uh, behind pathogenesis and also in terms of, of resistance. Because asymptomatically in infected people are basically resistant to disease because they get the infection and they don't usually get the disease it, they don't get the disease, but and they don't usually recur, although some do. So one of the early observations we, we made was that these two species, Leishmania brasiliensis, which is uh, sort of notoriously considered to be the one that is most pathogenic and causes most mucosal disease, and Leishmania panamensis, that in fact the immune response, due, delayed cutaneous hypersensitivity, and both the, uh, in, uh, the antibody response were higher in those individuals infected with Leishmania brasiliensis than panamensis. And this is a lot of people. I mean, it was 440-something uh, participants. And um, it was clearly a very strong difference. And then time of evolution, chronicity. And so the DTH response was directly proportional to the time of evolution. So you say, what's first? The, the, you know, the, the, the chronic disease uh, or, the, or the immune response? And it turns out that, that the um, immune response contributes to the disease. And this was also true of, of the antibody, but it was less, less clear in the antibody than the cell-mediated response, which is more uh, 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 participatory in the pathogenesis. So years later, this is just a recent, the one, the uh, slide I just showed you is, is from 1989, and this one is from this year. The inflammatory response that's induced by infection with Leishmania differs according to the isolate. So strains isolated from patients with chronic disease induce a series of chemokines that are associated with the attraction of neutrophils and monocytes to the site, whereas strains isolated from individuals who had self-healing disease, in other words, it healed. When they came back for treatment, it was healed. And we only saw them because we were there doing this prospective study. Otherwise, in a clinic, they just wouldn't come back. And so the, the response elicited by these strains contributes to the chronic disease. 
in contrast with the response elicited by these other strains. And these are all of the same species. So there's a lot of um, uh, uh, heterogeneity in terms of the, the, the pathogenicity and in many other characteristics, the phenotypes of, uh, in terms of drug susceptibility of different strains of the same species. So just to summarize that, you have here the, the macrophage, in this case, infected with a chronic, uh, an isolate from a chronic uh, patient. And these are the, the uh, chemokines that attract monocytes to the site and neutrophils to the site, which are uh, inflammatory cells, but they're also potential host cells. Another early observation we made was that the clinical outcome in terms of recurrent disease or chronic disease is correlated with the susceptibility of the macrophages to infection. So this was uh, the, uh, the same strain of parasite, but in macrophages from asymptomatically infected individuals in green healthy donors in black, and patients who had recurrent disease in red or chronic in red in this case. And you can see how the uh, number of infected cells on the horizontal axis and the number of parasites per 100 cells is higher in these two susceptible groups. We tried for a while to figure out why that was, and recently we had some insight into that. Um, but another observation intervened, and that is that um, drug susceptibility of strains that were isolated prior to treatment and at the time of recurrence allowed us to, to identify strains that showed primary resistance. In other words, they were already resistant. The blue line shows the initial strain, and the fuchsia line the strain isolated at recurrence. And we have the infection index here on the vertical axis and the antimony concentration on the horizontal axis. And the um, uh, infection index here, it, it just doesn't go down. You increase the drug and there's no impact on the survival. So that was a resistant from the outset before treatment had started. And this other group of secondary resistance where the initial strain was relatively susceptible and the strains isolated in two recurrences had developed resistance here. Because they should, if they're, if they're susceptible, they should, the index should go down with the drug concentration. But this is only 40% of the cases that we saw with treatment failure. And it was a group of 20 patients that we had the, the opportunity to have the primary strain and the recurrent strain. And 60% of those that failed treatment had were infections with a drug susceptible strain. And so, okay, uh, therapeutic outcome is multifactorial, okay? And even when there's resistance, that's not the total explanation necessarily for, for, for treatment failure. But in, these, in this case, this was an opportunity to try to understand what are some of the host factors that contribute to treatment failure because in this case you know you had a susceptible strain. So we went back to these cases and looked at drug transporters of the macrophages of the host cell and first of all, the drug susceptibility using the patients, the macrophages from patients who responded or macrophages from patients who failed, we found that the, the survival of the same uh, strain of parasite that was susceptible, was a susceptible strain transfected with luciferase, that the, in the macrophages of the, of the patients who failed, their survival was higher. So there was something about those macrophages that influenced the susceptibility to the drug. Because it was the same parasite, and the only thing that was different was the source of the macrophages. 
So in uh, uh, an array, uh, microarray panel for drug transporters was utilized to examine the, the transporter expression in these uh, cells. And it turns out that the transporter expression and parasite were inversely related in terms of the ABCB6, one of the ABC ATP cassette uh, 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 transporter uh, was, was directly, was inversely correlated with the survival of the parasites. And that was also true for the uh, metallocyanine uh, tr heavy metal transporter. And since it's antimony, that's a heavy metal. And so there was a, a, a relationship between these drug transporters and the outcome there that's completely independent of, this, of the susceptibility of the parasite to the drug. But these transporters influence the uh, drug reaching the parasite. So Leishmania and trypanosomes are kinetoplasts. And they have this organelle, which you can see here, this dark line, and by electron microscopy you can see here. And it's composed of maxi circles, which are mitochondrial DNA, and mini circles that code guide RNA that edits the transcripts from the mitochondrial DNA. And these mini circles, seen here, are naturally amplified extranuclear DNA that's like the molecular biologist's ideal target. Because you start with five to 10,000 copies per cell, and then you amplify from there. So it, using this target to uh, detect Leishmania gives you a very sensitive assay, and, and you find a lot of surprises. And we've uh, started to use this buccal, buccal lamp epicenter kit, which is a swab that's used for paternity testing and uh, uh, forensic applications. And it's very efficient. You can take a sample from the nasal mucosa or from the tonsils from the conjunctiva and you can amplify Leishmania from those samples, even in asymptomatically infected individuals. And here's what you, when you amplify the kDNA, this is the, the product that you get. You can see from monocytes. In skin tissue fluid, it's negative, okay? Until you do uh, southern blot, which gives you another level of sensitivity. And you can see the bands here, these three positives, and here the, confirming the, the uh, presence of the Leishmania kDNA. And so using this approach, we were able to see that patients before treatment have parasites in their normal skin in other words, not from the lesion, but some distance from the lesion, from monocytes. And we were also able to do xenodiagnosis to do uh, infection of sand flies by feeding on, on some of the patients. It's a small proportion, but it gives you proof of principle that the DNA is not just a, uh, you know, some sort of artifact. And also in normal skin, we were able to culture from normal skin. And after treatment, you continue to see this positivity. And this is not immediately after treatment, it's several, several weeks after treatment. And as I mentioned before, in asymptomatically infected individuals and people who have recovered from leishmaniasis, you continue to find um, uh, in the blood with the monocytes, 37% of 91, normal skin, we didn't do that, and in mucosa, 23%, and 39 had e either one or the other, or both. And this is just a single sample, okay? If you took, a, or if you repeated this, you'd probably find more positives. And when you figure how many times a person gets bitten by a sand fly in an endemic area, 
I mean, it's not one time. It can be hundreds of times in a single night. And so the possibility that this infection can be acquired from asymptomatically infected or recovered individuals seems quite evident. It's hard to prove, though. And another uh, point is that during active cutaneous leishmaniasis, we found also in, in the blood, so there's a hematogenous uh, dissemination, and in normal skin, and 82% of, of patients with only cutaneous lesions have leishmania in the mucosa without any pathology. So it used to be thought that metastasis was equivalent to mucosal disease. If you had metastasis, you got mucosal disease. But in fact, metastasis is, is probably the, the, the rule rather than the exception. And the exception is when you get an inflammatory response that um, uh, triggers the development of mucosal disease. So the uh, uh, parasite is, is very um, ubiquitous in um, sylvatic animals, and it's very adaptable to different hosts and to different circumstances. And so basically this is the, the let's say, the zoonotic transmission cycle that gets uh, 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 into humans when they are occupationally exposed in the, uh, to the zoonotic cycle in the, in the, in the jungle. Oops. And then they come back to their homes, and sand flies that are adapted to living around the homes, because the homes are basically also kind of in the, in the forest, then they can begin to be transmitted within the domestic uh, setting. And so these are, this is a, a age distribution of the sylva of sylvatic transmission, where you see here uh, very young children, and 16 to let's say 35 years is where you get the peak, and it's mainly males. So that's a typical uh, profile of sylvatic transmission, and here is a profile of domestic transmission where you have very young children getting the, the disease, and there's a male to female ratio that's, that's almost equivalent. The prior situation where human individuals would go into the forest and get occupationally exposed has now been uh, supplanted by entire communities being built in areas that are uh, uh, deforested, and then the communities are built up. And this has resulted in the urbanization of transmission. And the urbanization and the domestication of transmission has uh, an impact on who gets infected. And children are one of the most vulnerable uh, populations under those circumstances. And so exposure at an early age results in a high incidence of disease among children and symptomatic infection is higher in children than it is in adults. You, you get more asymptomatic infection when people are infected older than when they're infected as children. And the treatment in children is less effective than it is in adults. And I'll tell you a little bit about why that happens. But in, in, the, in the endemic area where we work, 23% of patients are under 12 years of age. And 30% of the lesions are on the face. It's, it's like the, the, there's a propensity to have the lesions on the face, and this is another uh, social uh, issue. So I mentioned that treatment was less effective in children, and this was a study that was conducted in the uh, uh, endemic area of Tumaco, and the response of 10 versus 20 days. The treatment is normally 20 days, but it's essentially impossible to get adherence to 20 days of treatment. So the idea was if you could treat for 10 days, 
and get a, 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 a similar outcome, if not as good but close, this would be an alternative because at least it's achievable. So this study sought to see if you could reduce the number of days of treatment and still get an acceptable outcome. And so you can see here in children under five years of age, children five to 14 years of age, and uh, individuals 15 years of age or older, the response was quite different. And whether it was 10 days or 20 days, children under five years of age had a, a, a really poor, poor response. And pre prior to this study, people had not included children in clinical trials because it's like, oh, how can you can include children in clinical trials? But, you know, that was some time ago. And now NIH and others, it's obligatory to un give equal opportunity for inclusion of those people who are affected by the disease to participate in clinical trials. And when we observed this, this was another thing that was pretty controversial. Oh boy, it's only a few kids, can't be true, um, because nobody else had seen it. They never saw it because they never included kids in a, in a clinical trial before. So what's going on? Uh, a colleague of mine, Barbara Herwald, who's at the CDC, uh, when we told her about this, she said, oh, we've been doing, because CDC dispenses the, the treatment for leishmaniasis in the United States, and they said they had evidence that there might be a pharmacokinetic difference in kids compared to adults. But the study, it was a population uh, uh, pharmacokinetic study, and we actually did uh, um, a study in, in children while they were still completing that study and she participated. And here you can see this is the time concentration curve, the antimony concentration here and the time uh, uh, of, uh, of up to, to 25 hours, oh, excuse me, 35 hours. And you can see that the adults that are fuchsia have a larger area under the curve than the children that are red. The children actually have only 55% of the drug exposure that adults do when they get the same dose per kilogram. And that was true, you know, on the day one and also on day 20, the, this uh, decreased exposure to the drug and the lower uh, C max, the maximum concentration in children as well. And this was related to the more rapid elimination in children. And so this happens with a lot of drugs in children that they basically are treated like little adults and, and they're not. They're physiologically different and, and it's something that I think is important to, to you know, share with you and uh, there's a lot to be done in terms of defining the pharmacokinetics in children. So who are the, the problems? So here you have it, adults versus children, and then another group are the elderly. And the elderly with leishmaniasis are another problem in terms of treatment because it, they tend to accumulate. They don't excrete the, the, the drug as much so they can get uh, a, a toxic level of, of drug in their system. And this has serious adverse cons consequences. So I want to tell you about a study that we did to try to find an alternative to the antimony. And this is an oral drug called miltefacine. And so we conducted a, a, a non-inferiority trial. And this was done in children um, in three different sites, in Cali, in Chaparral, which is another in the state of Tolima, and also on, in Tumaco. And in this case, these children are the brothers and sisters of some of the patients, because in order to do this trial, the children required 28 days of treatment, and that means they had to come and move with their families to a place in the urban center to be able to have directly observed supervised treatment. And so these kids 
have on the uniform of the school in the town, which is different from where they would go to school normally. So it was really a, a, a you know a logistic uh, um, challenge, and the families were were very interested to to have an alternative, and so they were very participatory. But this was one of the odysseys that's very much like the the experience of Horton the elephant and his dear egg. This study received a very high priority score by NIH in 2003. And so it was funded by NIAID as part of an iCider. But then it got canceled because Columbia is a dangerous place. And the monitor the, from the United States was unwilling to go to Columbia to, to be the clinical monitor of the study. So we had to stop, we couldn't start the study. So we thought this was pretty important because you can see that kids aren't getting an adequate treatment and this oral drug could offer an alternative. And so we reapplied to the Colciencias and in 2005, two years later, it was approved by Colciencias and we, we thought, hey, we can do this. And when we wanted to start the study and the miltepicin was donated by the, by the drug company, it was held in customs for several months and so we couldn't start. And during this time, from 2003 to more or less 2007, there was an epidemic in Chaparral that involved 30% of the patients were children. And this was like, we were trying to do this coincident with that. But with all this, these difficulties, the, the epidemic was waning by the time we really got started with this study. But anyway, we started the study, the end of the epidemic, slow enrollment. Oh, so we had to get an extension, but it was a, it was a no refinancing extension, no more money, even though you've been paying people all this time to be doing the study that you couldn't do. And so we had to have the extension, put some more sand in that hourglass, and um, uh, forge ahead. We did. We did an interim analysis. The difference was significant, and we finished the study. What happened? Glucantine, which is the antimonial drug, miltefacine per protocol, 87 versus 71 percent, and with the intent to treat, 69 versus 83. So it's clearly non-inferior. The study was designed as a non-inferiority study because you can do it with far fewer patients than if you want to demonstrate superiority. And in order to decide that you can treat children with a drug, if it's at least as good as the other one, that's enough evidence. And so that's what we did. So this was published in 2012. and. They still haven't gotten the drug in Colombia for in the in the pediatric formulation, so. But there is a solution. And miltefacin is an effective treatment that could be adaptable to home management. So all the logistics of taking the child every day to be to the clinic to get the drug for for 28 days in this case, and it would be 20 in the case of antimony can be managed by something like this. And this, this isn't rocket science, you know, it's not like high, uh, you know, whole genome analysis and things like that. But these are things that can actually make a difference. But the reason a lot of times that they don't is for reasons that are totally unrelated to biomedical research. And we need to pay attention to those things. So what are the lessons from Leishmania? Adapt to change. The response to provocation defines the outcome. This is so true in our life. Road rage, you know. <laughs> uh, take advantage of adversity to become resilient. Persist and prevail. So 
I'd like to say that our careers reflect those who have nurtured our vocation. The, the younger people here who are studying, you'll see that in retrospect. If you've had a kind uh, mentor, you will be a kind mentor to your students. If you've had an ogre, you'll probably be an ogre. You know? And so I feel that CDM and the people that I work with are kind of elephant birds that have emerged from the care that has been taken of my adopted egg. And I hope that will always be true. Another something I want to share with you, which I was amazed to see, there's actually scientific evidence in a journal called the Social Support, excuse me, the, the Journal of Experimental Social Psychology. And the title of the article is Social Support and the Perception of Geographical Slant. And the point is that the acuteness of that mountain looks pretty intimidating when you're by yourself. And they showed this scientifically. And when you have company, but it has to be good company, it has to be camaraderie type company, and the perception of the height and the challenge is completely different. And so, I have to say, I've had the greatest company. I really have. And there's so many, and these are not all of them. But they're the ones who we could get pictures from. <laughs> and this is, in the end, what it's all about. Um, I have one more slide after this. It takes a while to get everybody on board. <laughs> and uh, let's see, uh, Dan's in here somewhere. <laughs> Here's, here's Mark Everhard. Mark Everhard was one of the, uh, the investigators when it was a Tulane program. And these are the people who carry on in different places, you know, around the world. This is our, the people who have nurtured us and who we have nurtured. And I think that under those uh, special circumstances, great things are possible. Anyway, let's move to the next one. So my final message is that more than a plan, it's all about purpose. I made a lot of plans. I've written grants, but things come out different. It took 10 years from the first idea of that Miltefeson study till it was actually, the results were available and beginning to be implemented. So thank you very much.